2023 has been a good time to be a gamer. From remakes and ports like Resident Evil 4 and Metroid Prime to amazing original games like Jedi Survivor and Hi-Fi Rush. This year has been banger after banger. I mean, June alone has had more than enough to keep you busy with the likes of Diablo 4. And just when you thought you'd run out of excuses to not go outside, there's Final Fantasy 16 and the Summer Game Fest filling your backlog for the next year and a half. What with the likes of Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, Spider-Man 2, Like a Dragon Gaiden, Alan Wake 2, Mortal Kombat, that one Sonic Superstars. Stop! My penis can only get so erect. But there are a few games I feel have slipped under the radar that are well worth adding to your seemingly endless list of games to play. So with nothing better to do and a Tears of the Kingdom video standing like way too much effort, here's three games you may have missed in June alone. Before you say anything, Sonic 06 is 17 years old. Let that sink in. Like, it's probably been sneaking into bars with your creepy uncle trying to buy it drinks for the last two years. Now, those who are old like me will remember that Sonic 06 is widely panned as one of the worst games ever. So, why is it here? As we've previously established on this channel, Sonic fans are a little bit crazy. And Madman Chaos X looked at the original release, a game they had never played, and said to themselves, I can fix that. And I'll be damned, because that's exactly what he did here. Project 06, or P06 if you're feeling naughty, is a grand up remake of the original game in the Unity engine that sought to initially bring it to PC, but has quickly become a super solid game in its own right. Get it? Super? But how? I hear the contrarians say. The original is the gameplay experience of your teeth being removed in a back alley by a guy who's totally a dentist without anesthesia. Or in other words, needlessly painful and probably not advisable for your health. However, after playing through P06, I was surprised how easily I could remember each level. From the apocalyptic fire tornado chase in Crisis City, the calming vibe of Ocean Wave that suddenly ramps up in an orca chase, to the thrilling opening of White Acropolis' snowboarding that turns into Metal Gear Sonic. It's all super memorable. The major thing that hampered the original release was a rush development and lack of QA. Chaos X, however, has been working on this project for the better part of five years and has released several demos, each improving and optimizing the game, and it really shows. It also shed some light on what Sega was originally trying to do with the initial release. Create a game that combined aspects from all their previous efforts, like Adventures and Heroes, into what should have been the magnum opus of the series design ethos up to that point. But Chaos X wasn't happy just fixing what was already there. They've gone above and beyond to put their own stamp on the game. All characters feel uniquely diverse and are a joy to play. Sonic is still your typical get to the end ring as fast as you can and focuses more on track mastery and pattern memorization while well, Shadow is a much more combat-oriented character. Now, it is admittedly basic, but the trick is figuring out how to decimate foes as effectively as possible, and he's noticeably faster than he ever was in the retail release. The same can be said for Silver, who can now grind on rails, and when he reaches top speed, he begins to glide along the ground, making him feel far less of an odd duck this time around with his snail-paced gameplay from the original. But the titular hogs aren't the only characters you'll play as. Like Adventures and Heroes, you'll occasionally have to pass control to the other cast of Woodland critters. However, they're integrated into the levels far more seamlessly, meaning they're more of a nice distraction that seeks to shake up the gameplay, and they never overstay their welcome. Tails is that floaty but quick feeling that no game has replicated since Adventure 1. Knuckles and Rouge no longer defy all logic, and make you question if this is just a bad game, or have you made a terrible life choice in choosing to be a gamer? WHAT IS THIS?! <laughs> Amy and Blaze steal the show in Silver's campaign and almost make you wish that they had more levels built around them. Yeah. Amy Rose, usually the worst character in any Sonic game, is now one of the most enjoyable characters to play as. It just makes you want to replay levels over and over, like the best Sonic games do. P06 also really wants you to master it with rewards for doing so. S-ranking all the Sonic's levels gives you Super Sonic, a hyper mode for Shadow, and even an upgrade for Silver that makes him even more like a particular Ginger X-Man. Honestly, it's just super addictive, and the addition of opening scenes to certain levels, new character animations, and a unique lighting for each character's version of a level has truly made this a unique experience and redeemed the original, not least because it just looked at the story and said, thanks, but no. Now, it's not perfect. True Blue fans may feel it's a little on the slower side. The game occasionally hiccups, but that could also be my old ass PC. The more realistic models can look a little jarring against Sonic and his pals. <laughs> 
And Silver isn't quite as fun to play when compared to Sonic and Emo Sonic. However, this is still a work in progress, but a damn fine one. And it makes a staggering impression when you realize that it's more or less been ported and optimized by two people. If nothing else, like most Sonic fan games, it's completely free, and the OST for 06 is so ridiculously good. Like Aquatic Base. Absolute banger. Now I am a huge fan of pre-game Discharge, the show, not the bodily function, you sicko. And when he mentioned that he helped make a game, I had to check it out. And boy, am I glad I did. Class of 09 may look like your run-of-the-mill visual novel, but it's anything but- <laughs> Instead, it's a super dark, hyper satirical comedy of American high school culture in the mid to late 2000s. How dark is it? Well, the first game opens up with main character Nicole proudly proclaiming she's a sociopath and has her father unalive himself and blame her in the note he leaves behind. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. From discovering your photography teacher as a white nationalist, the guidance counselor wants to normalize relationships with minors, and every male character you interact with wants to end up on Dateline with Nicole, despite them being gross middle-aged gym teachers. And Class of 09 The Re-Up somehow goes above and beyond its predecessor and its subject matter. From creating a fake charity and selling homemade crack to past civics, tricking a teacher into agreeing with Mein Kampf and reading it out loud in front of a Jewish deli, to accidentally killing your mom because you snorted her last beta blocker. There are so many moments in this deceptively run-of-the-mill looking visual novel that just set it apart, making it kinda hard to quantify in words without spoiling it. While it explores the high school culture of the time, there there are aspects of it that no doubt persist in some form today, while also highlighting the experience women like Nicole have throughout their lives. It deals with topics that other games and media in general are too afraid to even broach, like abuse, depression, essay, sex work, and a lot of other things I can barely talk about because YouTube will probably bury the video for being advertiser unfriendly. And let's face it, this video will probably fail as it is. Which is probably why the game's gotten so little coverage. It's very much punk in its design and doesn't really care who it offends. While it is funny, there is a nugget of sincerity buried in it, making light of some heavy stuff almost like a teenager would, but highlighting situations that are no less real and serious. Another really great thing about Class of 09 is that the entire game is voiced, meaning you don't have to read it like a lame old person. And the voice acting is amazing. Nicole's VA Elise Lovelock does a fantastic job with the material. Now, the character isn't exactly likable. She's what a teenager is, the worst person ever. You are so f pathetic. I hope you kill yourself while your mom watches. Seriously, go ask your parents if you were a joy at that age. They'll probably lie and say you were or save you a lot of therapy and self-actualization. Again, it just captures that teenage angst without feeling hokey or like someone did a bunch of market research to please a specific crowd. And it's genuinely hilarious, if not really f***ed up. Because I don't know if you know this, but high school f sucks. You have no money, you have to ask to go to the bathroom, and you definitely knew the types. The meathead jock, the try-hard wannabe cool dude, and the awkward socially inept nerd. Blaze. Like, Blaziken the Pokemon? Yeah, that might have been me as a teen. But they're all dealing with a lot of shit, too. Parents that don't listen and or care about you being forced to just suck up shitty situations and get over it, and how any tiny little imperfection instantly becomes ammo for your peers to destroy whatever standing you have. While some of the situations are admittedly a little over the top, it does feel really grounded in some reality and experience of the writers. Knowing the only way to effectively retell these stories is to over-exaggerate. If it sounds like something that might interest you, I'd dip your feet in with the original or the real and show some love to developer SBN3. They're clearly making more thoughtful and interesting stories than a lot of other devs I can think of. The only real complaint I have about both games is the lack of any noticeable OST, and I didn't even notice that until I started writing this script. And it's not really for the easily offended, but if it sounds interesting, hit up Steam and relive the glory days of 2008 when your face was covered in more boils than a cartoon witch and we were blissfully unaware just how bad the recession was gonna be. I'm a 90s baby. <laughs> which means I have undiagnosed ADHD and or depression. And I'm old enough to remember where I was during the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky controversy. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Oh no, you pretty sauce. 
but not old enough to have my own PC or cool enough to have parents that would get me one to see the rise of the FPS. Luckily, the boomer shooter has been making a comeback, and one such game that's been on my radar for a while now is Warhammer 40k Bolt Gun, a retro throwback that seemed very much inspired by the original Doom with its use of 3D voxel environments, but 2D pixel characters. But thanks to the benefits of modern PC tech, it's not running at a frame rate that could be considered stop motion. I've talked before about how much I love Doom 2016, but I wasn't the biggest fan of its follow-up as I felt it was a bit too feature bloated. Bolt Gun immediately has filled that void, a hyper-violent metal album inspired game that harkens back to the original Doom's design. That after a rather rambling exposition at the start just dumps you into the action. You play an ultramarine of the Adeptus Astartes. Now for those of you who, unlike me, have probably had sex recently, you probably have no idea what those words mean. Think Captain America, but 8 feet tall, clad in Fallout power armor, with chainsaw swords and pistols that fire rockets instead of bullets. If that sounds badass, congrats, you're right, and you may or may not be Henry Cavill. Bolt does a really good job making you feel like a towering war machine. Every step you take shakes the earth, and at the start of the game, despite knowing you're going into a demon-infested planet full of nightmares that want to kill you and have guns, your only weapon is a chainsaw and a shoulder charge so powerful it turns what was once reanimated corpses into red mist and chunks of meat. And the testosterone injections to your brain don't stop there. By the time you finally get a gun of your own, it feels like you should just give the enemies a chance to run before you turn them into Swiss cheese. Like it's in Inspiration Doom, each gun has a different function and purpose, meaning you never feel like you've been given the same tool with incrementally more damage. Hell, the second gun you get actually has lower damage and range than the titular Bolt Gun, but the shotgun is for handling clustered mobs that love to rush you. The plasma gun literally melts enemies, but fires slower moving projectiles, making it more suited for larger enemies with bigger hitboxes. And the heavy bolter acts like a minigun, where it has an insane rate of fire and ammo, but takes a hot minute to spin up. The game also incorporates wider areas and more arena style settings for you to fight in, and your position is constantly something you have to be aware of with how aggressive the enemies can be. Despite the fact you're wearing a tank, your armor isn't impenetrable. You're also surprisingly quick on your feet. A lot of upgrades in your left trigger ability are movement orientated, which again draws focus on your position and just gives the game this rapid flow to the action. You're also encouraged to explore to find secrets and more enemies, as made evident by the end of level screens which detail what you missed and how long you took to get through it, promoting repeat playthroughs with optimized gameplay. And despite its edgelord over the top fuck you mom I'm 14 now vibe, it's got a lot of self-awareness I adore. Hitting the taunt button has your space marine spout one-liners that would make Americans cringe with how patriotic you sound. I don't know, I guess I just find it funny that space marines are just hyper-violent Jehovah's Witnesses. All that said, it's not perfect. Level design can sometimes be a little confusing, and environments blend together after a while, and the darker colour palette can make it hard to make out where you're getting shot from. But given the last Warhammer release was a bit of a train wreck, Bolt Gun is a breath of fresh air, and really makes me interested to see more from developer Orok Games. But there we go, three games to check out in between Tears of the Kingdom and Final Fantasy 16. Or if you've somehow found enough free time in the days to actually finish the insane amount of bangers we're getting this year. I mean, I still haven't had a chance to check out System Shock despite loving Bioshock or even Soul Hackers 2 from last year. Ah well, at least there aren't any more Persona games coming out to distract me. Oh no. Are there any games I missed? What have you guys been playing? Let me know in the comments below. Like or dislike to stick it to the algorithm. Subscribe if you want to see more. And check out my last video on Resident Evil 4 to add to the never-ending list of things on your backlog. See you in the next one, guys.